This week on Christian World News, Iraq explodes in violence. Hundreds are dead in sectarian attacks. The tiny Christian community is caught in the middle. Plus, preaching the gospel in the world's largest Muslim country. This Egyptian-American evangelist went to in Indonesia and hundreds came forward to accept Christ. And a lost boy finds his home. He spent his youth fighting for Sudan, South Sudan's independence. Now he's helping build new leaders for his country. As sectarian violence rips Iraq apart, the country's Christians fear for their future. Hello, everyone. I'm Wendy Griffith. And I'm George Thomas. Iraq is awash in violence. More than 1,000 people were killed in April and May. While the war pits Sunni versus Shia Muslims, it also affects the country's Christians. Greg Musselman of The Voice of the Martyrs Canada is just back from Iraq. Earlier in the week, I spoke with him about the situation there. Greg, it is truly spiraling out of control. 500 Iraqis dead just in this month alone. Is Iraq falling apart? Yes, uh, I would say so, George. I mean, a civil war could happen at any time, and it really appears that it's descending into that. And because of what's going on now with the, the bombings of markets, roadside bombs, those kinds of things, uh, there's a lot of fear there, definitely. You know, the believers there are scared. Uh, yet, uh, the other hand, there are many that are willing to stay and advance the gospel. Uh, but uh, definitely the church there has been decimated. This is Muslim on Muslim, Shia versus Sunni, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's uh, you've got your you know, radical elements of both those groups. Uh, you've got Al Qaeda. You've got all these other groups that are bombing each other. Uh, you know, of course, the Christians get caught in the middle. The reality is, uh, many of the Christians have left the country. I've reported on this over the years uh, since the war uh, in Iraq. You know, the reality is that Saddam Hussein was he was good for the Christians. He protected them. Yeah, but now with him gone. Uh, it's, uh, it's a free-for-all in the country, and as you said, the Christians are caught in the crossfire. You've got a very strong uh, dictatorship, uh, you know, like Saddam Hussein, who protected the church in a sense. Uh, for those that are trying to follow the Great Commission and advance the gospel and the kingdom of God, uh, even under Saddam's time, there was difficulty if they were advancing the gospel. Maybe not so much from the government, yeah, uh, but yeah. from their families and uh, from, you know, Muslim leaders. As you mentioned, there's been a mass exodus of Christians. Uh, tell us about the, the Christians you met uh, in Iraq who are staying. Why, why have they decided to stay and, and how are they affecting uh, their country? Well, you know, I, I asked one pastor uh, who had been an associate pastor in Baghdad. Now, he's up in Erbil in the Kurdistan area. And I said, look, you know, you've got maybe 200,000, maybe more Christians that are still left, but majority have left, over a million. And I said, how do you feel about that? He says, well, there's still 30 million that need to be reached. And uh, so we're seeing, you know, new churches, that evangelical churches that are starting up, church plants, uh, house churches are becoming very popular through Baghdad, Mosul, uh, even up into the Kurdistan area, and even south places like Karbala, which is a Shiite stronghold. Uh, so they're doing great work. God has called them there. And so they want to stay. And the Lord is working. Uh, many Muslims are having dreams and visions of Jesus. People are coming to know Christ. And so in the midst of a shrinking church, I mean, you have this sort of dichotomy, there are some that the Holy Spirit has definitely spoken to that they're supposed to stay. Uh, Greg, um, real quick uh, uh, question. You know, there is some talk about cutting up Iraq into different uh, partitions. Uh, you know, the Christians have for a long time said, listen, we need our own enclave. We need our own protection, our own police force that are manned by Christians. Is that still gaining any traction? Because they have become such a small minority. I mean, they were small before, but now they're just, I mean, it's still, you know, so the chances of having, a, you know, their own area is very, very small. I would think uh, the Christians are in a very, very difficult and precarious position. It's a tragic, tragic situation. So thankful that you are back safely. Greg Musselman of The Voice of the Martyrs based in Canada. So thank you for your insights. Always good to have you on the show. Thanks, George. And let's continue to pray for, uh, for Iraq and for our brothers and sisters in that country. Amen, Greg. Well, the Vatican representative to the United Nations says 100,000 Christians around the world are killed every year because of their faith. In an address to the U.N. Human Rights Council this week, Archbishop Silvano Tomasi said 
Credible research has reached the shocking conclusion that an estimate of more than 100,000 Christians are violently killed because of some relation to their faith each year. Silvano said many of these attacks take place in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. In China, an imprisoned house church pastor faces life or a death struggle. Gong Xiangleng once led an underground house church movement of more than 50,000 people. Back in 2001, the government convicted him of rape, arson, and leading a cult. Though many witnesses later recanted their testimony, he remains in jail. In a recent report in Christianity Today, his daughter says he is near death after years of torture and neglect. She wrote a public letter to Chinese President Xi Jinping requesting her father's release and medical treatment. Every week in countries around the world, pastors preach at ev evangelistic meetings, but it isn't so easy if the country is Indonesia, with the largest Muslim population on earth. Egyptian-American pastor Michael Yusuf spoke there recently, and some who heard him were threatened. But as John Wagi explains, that didn't keep hundreds from responding to the good news. Indonesia is home to more than 200 million Muslims. That's nearly 13 percent of the global Muslim population. So when the preparations began for a visit to Jakarta by Atlanta pastor Dr. Michael Youssef, it wasn't an everyday happening. What can profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? For three days, with music and prayer, Youssef brought a message of God's love to Indonesians. 15,000 people came, some facing persecution. Uh, but the most amazing thing to me is the hundreds of people that responded to the gospel message by coming forward. Dangerous as it was for some of them, and yet they were fearless. The love of Christ captured so many of them that hundreds uh, were coming in every one of those three nights. Yusuf says one pastor brought 300 people to the gathering, even though he was threatened with death. And of course, there was uh, threats and by some extremists. And, and the man with joy of the Lord said, it doesn't matter, what can they do to me? And so night after night, he would bring folks in to hear the gospel message, some of them for the first time. Organizers say a thousand people came to Christ during the meetings, and the hope is that millions more in the Muslim world will hear the good news on television and the internet. That they will bring glory to your name. John Wagi, CBN News. Two years ago, South Sudan became a new nation, having won its independence from Sudan. Well, since then, many former revolutionary soldiers have immigrated to the United States. But as CBN's contributing reporter Russ Jones brings this story of one soldier who stayed to build a new nation. That is the people who have the beauty to deliver the people of South Sudan. During a recent visit to his homeland, John Garong points out his uncle of the same name who led the revolution that led to South Sudan's independence. So we put them there because they are heroes. They've given us freedom. As one of the lost boys of Sudan, as they are often called, Garong was separated from his family as a young boy in the 1980s to fight for his nation's freedom from extremist Muslims. But 13 years into his military service under the command of his uncle, Garong heard the gospel message for the first time. Leaving the battlefield, this lost boy of Sudan enlisted in a new army, taking on a new fight. And that decision led him to Kenya. God is in this room. When I was here, I seen great vision, and I seen what God doing in this place. It was in room number four of his dorm at the Benguma Bible School. Garang absorbed all the Bible knowledge he could and received a calling to build leaders using biblical principles. This place is powerful, my brother, and this is where I give my life. It's in these hallways of higher education in Eldorot, Kenya, that Sudanese students have come from far, far away from home so they can learn new skills to go back home to South Sudan to build a bigger and stronger nation. Students like John Ganai from Bor, South Sudan, are direct descendants of the vision God gave to John Garong in room number four. Ganai is studying at Mount Kenya University in Eldoret to be a teacher. As you know, my country is so, uh, so barren, and we will use all the means to bring our country up. And we are, if we can use any old aspect of life, politically, economically, to develop our country, we shall be proud of it. 
Soon after graduation, Garong and his new bride, Tabitha, a fellow student at the Bible School, would choose to begin a new work in Kenya. Donations from generous supporters in the U.S. allowed the Garongs to acquire land in Moistbridge, Kenya, where they opened Children or People Ministries, which is an orphanage, training facility, and church. But even with a strong faith, John Garong admits it's a daunting task as he carries the weight of a nation on his back. I'm fighting a different battle, but the word of God says my, my burden is easy. In Moistbridge, Kenya, I'm Russ Jones. Thanks, Russ. Coming up, science versus faith. Why did a Catholic university in Belgium fire this professor for his belief in the healing power of prayer? From CBN. Oh, someone forgot to lock up. Everyone deserves a second chance. And you're sure it was Sharon? Definitely, Principal Travis. Maybe this time we can help her make another choice. What's up? I can't believe it. Sharon Meyer stole a bike in broad daylight, and Miss Travis just wants to let her slide by. Superbook! Log on to CBN.com and receive Superbook's newest episode, Jonah, for your gift of $25. Nineveh, God wanted me to warn them he was about to pass judgment. I say no. If Nineveh is doomed, then let it be doomed. I thought fish were slimy on the outside. Give the children you love the Word of God as a foundation in their lives. Of Nineveh! It is amazing. Your words have been heard by all of Nineveh. Superbook Jonah, available now. He healed the sick, walked on water, and rebuked the storm. Jesus performed miracles that changed the world, and he shared the secret to that power with you and me. Gordon Robertson, in his latest DVD, Our Father, Keys to the Lord's Prayer, takes you on a journey from King David's palace to the Sea of Galilee, revealing the mystery and the meaning of the greatest prayer of all time. You'll discover a deeper relationship with God, what it means to overcome evil, how to pray in the power of the kingdom, and the life-changing purpose God has for you. As a special bonus, you'll see a tour of some of Israel's most important sites and learn the amazing discoveries that are being uncovered today. Learn how to pray the way Jesus prayed and release the power of God's kingdom in your life. Get Our Father, Keys to the Lord's Prayer, available now. And welcome back to the show. To silence religious freedom is to silence the moral conscience of America. That from the Reverend Samuel Rodriguez speaking at an annual Religious Freedom Conference in Washington, D.C. this week. Rodriguez is president of the Hispanic Evangelical Association, but today he spoke of, to people of all faiths. He's calling on them to build together a, a firewall against unprecedented attempts by the government to violate religious liberty. He says recent actions by the IRS targeting Christian groups and the HS. HHS birth control mandate are examples of the dangers the road America is traveling on. I never would have believed in my generation that I would see this taking place. So silence is not an option. Today's complacency will lead to tomorrow's captivity. And religious freedom stands as the womb by which all the other liberties emerge and flourish. Reverend Rodriguez says the U.S. government needs to be reminded that it may be our earthly uncle, but he is not and never will be our heavenly father. In Belgium, controversy over a researcher fired for being too religious. The school that fired him, an historically Catholic university. Dale Hurt has that story from the city of Leuven. The Catholic University of Leuven is the oldest and largest university in Belgium. It was founded in the 1400s under the approval of the Vatican. But as modern Europe has secularized, so has the university. And even here, faith has come under fire. People can believe a lot of crazy stuff nowadays and not get fired from their jobs. But a senior research associate at the Catholic University of Leuven discovered that you better not believe that God can heal. Fernando Pauls worked at the university's Research Institute for Work and Society for 11 years without a negative review when he was suddenly fired. 
If you'd have asked me, do you get a new contract? I would say yes, of course. Do you have problems with your colleagues? No, everything's fine, you know. Uh, so there was no issues there. Um, a week later, I'm, I'm out. And I'm like, what, what, what happened? What happened was the Catholic University's great displeasure with Fernando's ministry website, powerthroughlove.be, that included testimonies of people healed through the power of God. The university saw some of these movie clips uh, of people giving a testimony of being healed, and they called that unscientific. The university, which declined our interview request, said when a researcher working on matters of a scientific or medical nature allows religion to take the place of science, he compromises the scientific reputation of the university and breaks the bonds of trust with the university. If I'm fired because of believing something unscientific like that, that Jesus Christ still heals, I'm fine. I'm okay with that, but it's wrong. Ward Kennis of the Christian Democratic Party serves in the Flemish Parliament. I was uh, very much surprised that a Catholic university, uh, which is also a university where I, I've studied myself, was behaving like this. Rick Torf, son faculty at the university, is also a national media figure who wrote about the case for the Flemish newspaper, The Standard. Freedom of religion means that uh, people can believe uh, whatever they like or whatever they feel attracted to. Torfs was recently elected faculty dean at the university and told us that if elected, he would rehire Fernando. So how can Belgium claim to have freedom of religion? Uh, that's a good question. A right is not a right when it cannot be exercised. Fernando, who has a heart for the persecuted church, especially in Pakistan, told us he feels privileged to have suffered for Christ but he also wants those Christians who come after him to be protected from discrimination. One day I'll stand in front of the Lord and then he will say to me, well done. That's all that counts. That's all. That's all that matters. The rest is details. Dale Hurd, CBN News in Leuven, Belgium. Up next, beating the odds, how a life-threatening disease led this man and his family back to faith and health. CBNnews.com. News you want, when you want, 24-7. Stay current with up-to-the-minute stories. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New York. I don't have to wait for my news anymore. CBNnews.com at your fingertips all day long. I only watch the stories I want to see. I find the story, I click on it, and boom, I'm there. Embassy in Washington, Eric Stackelbeck, CBN News. The source for your news, CBNnews.com. Come Give on, me Scott. that. <laughs> Bye. Ah, sure, life is busy, but I found a way to make a huge difference in people's lives. I guess you could say I'm changing the world right here from home. I bring medical supplies and doctors to people in need. And dig wells so that villagers can have clean and safe water to drink. I make it possible to preach the gospel in over a hundred countries, including right here in America. And when disaster strikes, I'm there providing food, thank you, and emergency supplies to give people hope again. Every day, CBN and I are making the world a better place. Here you go. My life is hectic, so I joined CBN through Pledge Express. My bank does all the work, and I know that my gift is being used where it's needed most. So become a CBN partner and join Pledge Express, because you can do a world of good right from where you are. Good morning. Are you ready to get started? He healed the sick, walked on water, and rebuked the storm. Jesus performed miracles that changed the world, and he shared the secret to that power with us. Learn how to release the power of God's kingdom here on earth. Get Gordon Robertson's latest DVD teaching, Our Father, Keys to the Lord's Prayer, available now. What would you do if a life-threatening illness robbed you of the ability to walk and talk and forced you to start all over? Mm. Well, the upcoming film, Hoovy, is the true and inspiring story of how a Midwest American family leaned on their faith in each other to regain hope and rediscover their lives. 
We're here on the set of Hoovy in Waxahachie, Texas. An all-star cast behind me is putting together the real-life story of Hoovy, a young man who overcame incredible odds because of his faith and courage. Director Sean McNamara of Soul Surfer fame once again brings a story of triumph to the big screen. When 16-year-old Eric Hoovy Elliott collapses on the basketball court, doctors discover a life-threatening brain tumor that could derail all of his hopes and dreams. After high-risk surgery, he must relearn life's fundamentals, walking, reading, even seeing clearly. Actor Cody Lindley plays the title role. I've always wanted to be in an underdog story, and I feel like this is an ultimate underdog sports movie you know, doing these type of things where I'm walking with the cane, it made me really humble and really want to ask questions and understand his struggle and his, his, his way of overcoming it. Hoovy's real life parents, Jeff and Ruth Elliott, say they could relate well to the biblical story of Job. During the time Hoovy was sick, their daughter also got very sick. Ruth lost her job and overwhelming medical bills threatened to undo everything the couple had worked a lifetime to build. Like in Job, even well-meaning Christian friends accused them of not being right with God. There are good friends that said, oh, you must have terrible sin in your life that uh, you're, you're being punished for, um, just like in the book of Job. And that's why we related so much to that book, because these were Christian friends who go to church with us, and they said, obviously, you've got some, you know, unresolved sin. With his family's love and tenacity, as well as his relentless determination to get back on the court, Hoovy surprises everyone, even his parents. I believed he would make it back. I didn't think he'd make it back to the level that he did. And we would look out the window and just wonder, oh my goodness, what have we inspired him to do? Um, but you know, against all odds, and even when the therapy was over, he continued it on his own at home. It's a miracle. Jeff wrote a book about his son's amazing comeback. After being rejected by more than a hundred publishers, he self-published, but didn't sell many copies. Five years later, Jeff and Ruth got a call out of the blue that someone wanted to make a movie about their story. You know, it's pretty amazing how it's all come together. So many times uh, that we just literally gave up and we said, you know, God, if this is to happen, you're going to have to take over. And every single time he did. When I gave up, he took over. It we arrived on the set the day they were filming a dramatic car accident scene. Actor Patrick Warburton of Seinfeld and Family Guy fame plays Hoovy's father, firefighter Jeff Elliott. He says it was inspiring to have the real Jeff, who was one of the extras, on the set. It's fun. You know, and at the end it takes like and goes, ah, you would have done it. Right, I did it differently. <laughs> That's he also says his mother is very happy he's in a faith-based movie for a change. She was thrilled, you know, just beside herself. <laughs> It's uh, it's fun. She's actually, you know, she's part of the contingency that's trying to get Family Guy off the air. <laughs> Actress Lauren Hawley, a well-known oh face from movies and television and real-life mother of three boys, plays Hoovy's mother, Ruth. When I read the script, I cried more than once, and I just really wanted to be a part of it. And then, now that I've gotten to know Ruth, we're going to be friends forever. <laughs> The real-life Hoovy learned to read again, dribble, and not only play basketball again, but went on to receive a scholarship to play college ball, where he scored 30 points and a winning shot in a regional game. I realized that I was so close to, to not having this life, and um, every day is a gift from God, and you really need to cherish it. Um, just love on your wife, love on your kids. You know, that's what I try to do. Hoovy. A story of faith, love, and a family's resolve to trust God and not give up comes to theaters sometime next year. What a great story. Thanks. Well, yeah. since I was there in Waxahachie, Texas, yeah. I love to say that name. They're in post-production now. They're in editing, and so the movie doesn't come out until next year. But if you'd like more, there's so much more to the real-life story. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a great link, a YouTube link, that uh, was put together by the screenwriter, Howie Klossner. Uh, you can check that out. You'll find the link on our website, cbnnews.com. We'll be back right after this. Hi, this is Pat Robertson. This is an important time in the history of America. It's an important time in the history of CBN. And what you do is so very important now. But we've got to get the gospel out here in America. We've got to help the poor and the needy. 
feed those who are hungry, clothe those who are naked, bring medical attention to those who are suffering, and more than anything, bring hope to those who are without hope throughout the world. So your 700 Club membership makes a huge difference. And I ask you to go to your phone and call. If you haven't already called in, we appreciate what you've done so much. So don't slack. We don't want our hands to be empty. We want to say, Lord, here are those who have come to you because of my labors. Telephones are available, toll-free line, and we just thank God for each one of you. So don't hesitate to call and do it now. Jesus performed miracles that changed the world, and he shared the secret to that power with you and me. Get Gordon Robertson's latest DVD, Our Father, Keys to the Lord's Prayer, and discover a deeper relationship with God, how to overcome evil, and realize the life-changing purpose God has for you. Learn how to release the power of God's kingdom in your life. Our Father, Keys to the Lord's Prayer, available now. I just started surfing five years ago. We actually said the, the Lord's Prayer when we got in the water the other day, and that's something I do. I watched our father recently, and I loved it. Gordon's teaching of the Lord's Prayer stood out. He's actually showing everybody, or he's teaching the steps to, to communicate with God. God wants us to be happy. He wants us to enjoy life. He's our Father, and He loves us. Well, new episodes of CBN's Superbook recently premiered in the Philippines. Yeah, exciting stuff. Well, the relaunch of the show aimed to teach children biblical values, just like the original series did for their parents. Lucille Talusan reports. The Philippine press and ministry partners, who are also Superbook fans, flocked to the cinema screening of its new edition. This was the first of many activities for the day-long launch of Superbook in the Philippines. Viewers were impressed with the state-of-the-art animation, and some were nostalgic, seeing their favorite cartoon return after more than 20 years. I cried. <laughs> when I love it. The part na nagpart yung Red Sea. So I was thinking, that's our God, and He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Energy is running high in the super launch of the Superbook Reimagined that's happening in one of the popular malls here in Manila. Most parents who came here are members of the Super Kids Club two decades ago, and today they brought their children to pass on the legacy of growing up and the knowledge of God's Word through the animated series of Superbook. Celebrities who volunteered to be part of the show all grew up watching Superbook. They say this was their way of showing gratitude to the cartoon that taught them biblical values. All the, the lessons that you can get from the Bible, it was really instilled in my life from watching these cartoons. And it's simple stuff like, you know, being, being honest, uh, respecting your parents. Seeing the fruit in the lives of the classic Superbook followers paints a bright picture for the coming generation. The picture that comes to mind is Gizmo with the Shield. Superbook in its very creative form but with such eternal value and with such um, life-changing messages. This show will protect the children. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Manila. Oh, well, it's going to bring so much excitement, the book, the Word of God coming to life. It is amazing, it truly sure amazing. Is. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Until next week, goodbye and... God bless you, everyone.